I've had my ups and my downs. I think it's an absolutely breakthrough experience. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show. The show designed to inspire the pursuit of your physical best performance. I'm your host, Brad Beer. Listen in as we delve into how the world's top physical performers achieve their success, as well as the highs, the lows, and the journey of getting there. Let's get ready, set, let's go. Welcome back or welcome to the Physical Performance Show brought to you by the Gold Coast Marathon and Pogo Physio. I'm Brad Beer, sports and exercise physiotherapist by trade and training and founder of Pogo Physio. As per the intro, the aim of this show is to educate and inspire you towards the pursuit of your own physical best. We do this through interviews featuring some of the world's top physical performers and also some of the world's preeminent experts in their chosen fields. Each week, we'll bring you a variety of episodes, including featured performers, expert editions, coaches' corners, and interest editions. And on today's episode, we feature an expert edition with renowned sports podiatrists, Paul Griffin and Simon Bartold, collectively making up Bartold Clinical. And this is a deep dive into the world of the athletic running shoe. In today's episode, myself, Simon and Paul, the first three-way chat for the Physical Performance Show, in fact, will discuss the modern running shoe, how it came to be, features of the modern running shoe, does running shoe segmentation or categorization have any place in today's running shoe landscape, reducing injury and preventing injury through running footwear, the role of maximalist and minimalist footwear, knowing when to replace your current running shoe, knowing whether to trial another pair of running shoes, and of course, selecting the best shoe for you. We'll discuss contemporary trends in running shoe manufacturing and the very exciting future of what the running shoe market holds, as well as touching on some interesting topics, including the introduction to the running shoe market of the Nike Vaporfly 4% as worn by world marathon record-breaking Elliot Kipchoge recently. This has been a heavily requested expert edition to bring you. And by way of bio, today's guests could not be better profiled and credentialed to share around this all-important topic. Dr. Paul Griffin, sports podiatrist, has a sports podiatry career spanning 20 years. In this time, Paul has provided services to the Perth Glory Football Club and chair of the Western Australian branch of the Australasian Podiatry Council. Paul's Bartold clinical colleague, Simon Bartold, likewise has a very impressive career. Across Simon's career to date, Simon has been the consultant at the Australian Institute of Sport Cricket Academy, the British Cricket Academy, and the Indian Cricket Team, as well as a number of other national sporting teams. Simon was a Deputy Director of Podiatry Services at the Sydney Olympic Games in 2000, and again chosen for medical teams at the Athens 2004 and Turin 2006 Olympic Games. Simon went on to attend his fourth Olympic Games in London in 2012, He's been the consultant podiatrist to Port Power in the AFL, and he's been an editorial board member for the Journal of Science and Medicine in Sport and the Australasian Physiotherapy Journal, as well as being a reviewer for the Australasian Journal of Podiatric Medicine and the British Journal of Sports Medicine. One of the interesting things that Simon's done in his career is he was part of the original engineering team that produced the very first ASICS Keanu shoe. And in more recent times, Simon was a head podiatry consultant working on the introduction of Salomon's first running shoe, the Salomon Predict. So let's jump in with these two podiatry titans and hear from the gentleman around all things modern running shoe. Here is my conversation with Simon Bartold and Paul Griffin. So this is a real treat for the Physical Performance Show to have Simon Bartold and Paul Griffin on the line to talk all things running shoes and how they relate to runners' ambitions to run pain-free and faster. So Paul and Simon, welcome to the Physical Performance Show. Thanks, Brad. Great to 
Great to be here. Gentlemen, uh, to give it a bit of context to a day in the life or a week in the life of uh, your professional careers, uh, Paul, uh, starting with yourself, what does your work life look like? And then, uh, Simon, over to you. Thanks, Brad. And uh, I think my my work life uh, has taken a bit of a change in recent times. Uh, So I graduated in uh, circa late 90s from Curtin University uh, in Perth, Western Australia, and it's... um, uh, I studied uh, Bachelor of Science Podiatry at was uh, at the School of Physiotherapy. So our, our line of training and the first couple of years anyway was in keeping with physiotherapy. And then we branched off into into that, that sort of, I guess, I won't call it a specialty field, but it's certainly an area of expertise. Once I qualified, I uh, always had that interest in, you know, the sports side of the, the, the profession. Uh, and I pursued that uh, with a, a couple of other guys. We set up a, a, a sports podiatry practice, but the model was always uh, working within multidisciplinary practices. You know, I was fortunate enough to, to work with, I'd say, dozens of physios, all of uh, uh, majority high calibre working for the local professional sporting clubs. So I guess, uh, you know, even though once we all graduate with the same qualification, once you find that pathway, I, I fell into this uh, role of bolting onto the side of physiotherapy practices and complementing the, the different services that we could provide. Uh, and my, my area where I ended up going into was uh, an interest in, in, uh, in footwear. Uh, after, that was after quite a while, so it's 20 years on now. Um, but uh, then I ended up uh, following more... Uh, continuing professional professional development in in footwear, so I was sort of flying abroad and doing different various courses in in footwear, mainly sort of concept, innovation, design, uh, those sorts of things in different schools around around Europe that that house those those courses and masterclasses. And then uh, uh, on one of those masterclasses a couple of years ago, I found my my way going to to the Netherlands. On the way through, uh, stopped here where I am now in, in France in a place called Annecy, uh, about 40 kilometres uh, on the from Geneva on the on the French side, and uh, that's where uh, where Simon was based at the time up until a few weeks ago, and uh, I've been here for for a year or so, just uh, a bit of family time, moved uh, moved away from clinical consulting and and uh, just co- focusing on some other things at the moment. And uh, and then yourself, Simon, uh, your career is. Uh is quite uh, stacked with uh, accomplishments and contribution to running footwear. Uh, can you give a little uh, pre-say or pressy of your, your career to date? Yeah, so, so my background is also in podiatry, but um, um, my, my history is basically in very de- de- dedicated um, uh, athlete care. So always worked in sports and community really, from a couple of years from the time I graduated and always in multidisciplinary clinics, so very um, strong association with uh, all forms of sport. And, and and that really, I guess, sort of gave me um, an entree at a time that was right, um, sort of the planets aligned for me to get involved in the in the footwear industry. Um, and I, I had a long career with, with ASIC, so I worked with them for many years, for over 20 years actually, Um but you know, it's it's been an incredible journey, really. I, I guess that um, had you had you told me when I was graduating in podiatry that I would have had the opportunities I had, I wouldn't have believed you. I've now I've now worked at four Olympic games, including one Winter Olympics, and um, just you know had this these incredible experiences and met amazing people, and had the opportunity to get much more involved in in the world of clinical biomechanics and research into sports injury. And now um, coming off the back end of, of four years at Salomon in France, where I headed up their uh, their initial road running program. So I was actually brought to France to initiate their road running project. So they had no road running footwear. So it was like a dream for me because I said, this is a blank, a blank slate. Um, there's no baggage. You can do whatever you want um, to get us on, on the map as a road running company. And that was my mission for the last four years. And now I'm back in Oz. So I've been back here for two weeks and um, have some great challenges here. Um, back to one of my great passions, which is Australian footy, um, doing some consulting with X-Blades, which is uh, uh, an Australian 
uh, company, uh, really vibrant company, and uh, also some uh, consulting with Salomon, of course. So it's been quite a journey for me, but a, an incredibly vibrant um, journey and uh, uh, one I, I've had no problem whatsoever going to work on a Monday. It's just been a, an amazing an amazing uh, uh, career for me. Simon, specifically when I was researching uh, a bit of background for both yourself and Paul, one of the things that jumped out was that you were involved in some of the early work on the ASICS Keanu shoe, correct? Yeah, actually the first project I worked on was a uh, was a shoe called the K07, which is actually a, a misnomer because that shoe was uh, was released in in the year 2000, so the millennial shoe. And uh, Essex actually wound back the clock, and it was just called the K08. It actually never had a nomenclature. So whilst it was the seventh in the series, it was actually just called the K08. And I'm really proud of my involvement with that shoe because that was the first IGS shoe or impact guidance system shoe. That was a concept that I came up with for for ASICs, looking at at impact load and and rather than looking at vertical load, looking at at how it actually happened in terms of the impact vector, and and trying to figure out how the shoe could deform in response to that load in a positive way. So it was a really cool project, and this is one of the great joys about being involved in this industry. That you know you can't you kind of walk down the street in Rundle Mall here in Adelaide and you, you see shoes and think. Yeah, I remember what my input into that shoe was, and I remember where I was when we we came up with that idea, and that's you know that's actually a pretty cool thing. Oh, what a what an amazing contribution! And I mean, uh, the footwear industry, gentlemen, uh, to wrap some size around it. I mean, I know it's many billions of dollars as a as an international industry, but what's the size of the uh, running footwear industry now? It's interesting. I, so I actually did a little. Uh, a little bit of research in terms of the the carbon footprint of athletic footwear um, very recently, and and so for, for Salomon they make about ten million pairs a year, and the carbon footprint of that is enough to run the entire city of Ansi for a year. Um, and to put that in context, Nike make uh, around about seven hundred and sixty million pairs of shoes a year. Uh, gentlemen, uh, I, I I really enjoyed Simon specifically on the Barthold Clinical Instagram. Uh, gallery recently you commented what is best for the runner is constantly evolving it's a constantly evolving topic with many different facets factors angles evidence and a splash of evangelistic attitude to further confuse the hell out of everyone so i think this is a, a good place to start the the convers the discussion specifically is i call it the footwear maze and how to try and navigate it i've been a practitioner for 12 years and it's something that I've made peace with the fact that it will always be a constantly changing landscape and one that practitioner, as a practitioner, I need to try and stay up to date with. But can we try and simplify this for the listener who is tuning in with the hope that they can learn something about the next time they go to make a shoe purchase, what it is that they might need to consider it to hopefully make a wise one. Well, Paul can chime in here. I actually reckon Paul wrote that. <laughs> yeah, but. I've been uh, doing uh, doing some work with Simon on the platform over the last, I don't know, I think I might have started the Instagram page. It's quite recent. <laughs> but I think we're all, I'll, I'll start by maybe maybe giving some perspective and of the athletic footwear industry. And, and, you know, footwear running shoes are essentially a piece of sporting equipment. It's not, it's not no different to going and, and buying a bike and choosing what bike that would, would suit you best. And that's a, that's a good one for a, say, a triathlete. We know they like particular bikes or a road bike versus a, versus a, a, a tri bike versus a mountain bike. They're all pieces of sporting equipment that have specific use. And what's a layer or two behind that specific use is that there's someone like Simon or someone that comes up with a concept that can essentially develop and design this product to essentially assist the athlete in using that piece of sporting equipment for its intended use. So, for example, you're not going to use a mountain bike uh, riding road races or riding road. You're going to use a mountain bike and a mountain system designed that way. So, I think first and foremost is you have to sort of profile what what whether you're the person buying the shoes or whether you're the practitioner, what what is suitable for the intended use. So, so I think that's the first thing. And then 
it doesn't really matter about anything else because 90% of the footwear is purchased off the back of looks anyway. So as long as it looks hot, they'll just buy it. Uh, so it's uh, there's, there's that aspect. And then there's other aspects of like, okay, um, all of those other factors that, that are sort of in the mixing bowl of like, you know, age, sex, weight, amount of Ks you do, uh, what what sport you do, obviously, and so on and so forth. So I think if it, if you're going back to sort of, uh, you know, essentially what, um, what the athlete can look for, well, I think they kind of need to work out what piece of sporting equipment they need to buy to start off with. And that's essentially where it starts. I think one of the things that drives me a bit crazy here is that there is a perception that there might be one common factor here that works for all people. That's the great untruth. You know, th- th- there is nothing that's going to work for everybody. It's not footwear. It's not gait retraining. It's not rehab. Th- th- there, 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 are, there is no one set rule that's going to work for every athlete. It just doesn't work that way because the human organism is incredibly varied. So it can't possibly work that way. So the knack to this is you've got to try to figure out you've got to try to level the playing field as much as you possibly can. So you've got to try to figure out the individual response to the intervention Um, and you've got to try to figure out exactly whether or not you can change the load. Brad, as you would know better than we would, that's that's a hugely multifactorial thing. So you've got to not only understand uh, load tolerance but you've got to understand load titration, so how, how how you would apply that. But in terms of athletic footwear or things like gait retraining, you know, you've actually got to really individualise the program. Um, one of the things that I think is a bit of an issue here and possibly plays a, a large role um, in injury, and the reason we see such a high incidence of injury in runners, is that I think they actually do leave technical retail quite often with the wrong shoe. They've been either pointed in the wrong direction or they have dictated the choice based on, as Paul says, colour or looks or whatever. Um, but the processes of selection at retail I think are somewhat flawed and they're also muddied by the categorisation of footwear into motion control, cushioning category or neutral category, you know, and those things are meaningless. They don't they don't really stack up and they're certainly not supported by the by the literature in any way that you could actually have an athlete come in and say, yes, you should have a motion control shoe or yes, you, you should have a cushioning shoe because the evidence is pretty clear in saying that those things don't actually influence the injury rates. Yeah, I'd like to add a bit to that. I think there's, um, Brad and Simon, I, reckon, oh, I, th- I feel there's a lot of noise in the industry as well. So, you know, Simon, um, you would appreciate that you designed this great shoe and it has its intended purpose, its intended use. It goes out there to the market then between the footwear company and the retailer, you know, there's a distributor and the, the guest of retailer gets on the rack and there's a, quite a few opinions along the way there and there might even be, let's be fair, there's a, there's a fair bit of business that goes on in the background. You know, you buy X amount of this shoe, uh, you know, you sell X amount of this shoe and there's an incentive for the retailer to do that. So, so then all of a sudden, uh, you know, there's a lot of noise amongst uh, the industry where that customer walks in the shop and then you've got to work out whether or not they are actually going to get the, the best, you know, shoe for them because yeah, there's other stuff that influences the outcomes of that as well. You know, so, so it's, it is a bit murky like that and that's why I've always acted as an advocate for my, my patients uh, when they present. Um, I'll, I'll also add another layer as to what Simon's suggesting as well is that, and this is the, the great debate at the moment with regards to footwear segmentation or running form versus uh, versus footwear, is that there there is, I, I feel uh, that there is a, a space for, for footwear prescription and it's, it's based off the back of um, how that patient presents uh, what what the intended use is, as I was going to say, suggesting earlier with regards to what, what do they actually want to use the shoe for, uh, then then going through um, you know some mechanical uh, characteristics of that that particular patient have, and being familiar with the product, the range of products that are available for that patient, and then saying you know okay, you're um, you're you're 45, you run three times a week, you weigh 85 kilos, you know, and you you know. You might have a bit of ankle equinus, uh, you, you know, or hallux rigidus, whatever. So I think you're probably better off suited for a maximalist rocker bottom type shoe. And then that person can then enjoy their activity uh, a lot more. They can actually get a few more Ks out. They could, you know, it's like a, it's, it's that sort of you act as an advocate for that patient. So 
So I still firmly believe that there is um, a space for footwear prescription, but in some cases, yeah, look, there's some people that would present and I'd go, wow, you really need a bit of help with your running form. So it just depends. I don't think that they are, they are definitely mutually exclusive uh, type uh, uh, factors when someone goes to buy a shoe or someone wants to run more or whatever it is. But it's it's uh, as going back to footwear, I do believe that there is a, is a space for footwear prescription. Well, one of the great contradictions of, of, of the industry is that you are trying to prescribe a mass production commercially available product. So you need to have a think about that. A lot of contradictions in those terms. And, and I think that, to me, that's always seemed to be quite a difficult thing. And I think it's not – and I'm not poo-hooing at all the concept that you might be able to prescribe a, a shoe because I'm not sure prescribe is the right word. You, sh- you should certainly be able to give a, um, an adv- uh, advice with the ad- advanced information. But it really gets around to the consultation process. So what, what information do you get from them? I mean, does retail actually understand the right questions to ask to ask in terms of what's your injury history, how how engaged are you in the sport? You know, do you come to the store bristling with Garmin's? Do you go over and pick up the latest runner's world? Or are you a bit overweight and obviously a novice? Because the rules change. The, yeah. immediate, immediately the rules change the, the moment you make those assessments based on that person walking through the door. And then how do you do the assessment? You know, do you do a rear foot? gait analysis, and I'm, I'm doing this as virtual inverted commas, um, you know, where you look at them from behind and you capture, you know, 20 to 25% of the stance phase of gait, in other words, bugger all, <laughs> um, and make decisions based on a fit to vertical model, which is just absurd. You know, it doesn't make any sense. So these are some of the challenges that we, we have, I think, at the moment that quite possibly are folding back into this very high injury rate we have in runners, which you know, people get a little bit hysterical about, but uh, we have some tools in place that, that can maybe help us reduce that a bit. You've got to remember that, uh, you know, as technology, say, for example, sports science is one thing, what we know about the research and uh, evolving constantly. Uh, and, and, you know, Simon making, uh, well, you know, the footwear industry, how we're always trying to find ways to, to get the most out of out of an athlete. Uh, it's like any industry. Um, and you would assume that there's that threshold as to, okay, so we create products that allow people to run further and faster. Well, that allows them to increase their load to the point where that threshold of, of injury still exists. Uh, you know what I mean? So it's it's kind of that, that, that balancing act really, isn't it? I guess from a, a clinical, you know, we're practitioners, this is how we view the world. But if we, uh, pardon the very bad pun, but put ourselves in the shoes of, you know, uh, listeners who don't have access to a practitioner and I feel it would be easy to be tuning in and feel a little bit discouraged because uh, it's kind of like, well, the practitioners battle with this and struggle with this and that we do. What chance do I have walking in uh, to a retail shoe shop in, in making a wise purchase? So uh, I guess ultimately we're talking about educating runners and one of the major frustrations I, I have had over my physiotherapy career to date as a practitioner is the over-attribution of the importance of the running shoe on the development of the running injury at the neglect of other major factors, the fact that they've gone from, you know, maybe nothing in terms of a running base to preparing for a marathon and they've developed an injury. I think running shoes have been um, endowed with mystical powers I just don't have um, at lots of different levels. Runners get injured because they run. That That's the bottom line, right? So, and, and, and it always amuses me when I talk to runners and, um, you know, you, you try to give them advice. Say, okay, what do you do? Well, I get up in the morning and I put my shorts on and I put my shoes on and I go out the front door and I turn right and I run. Do you ever turn left? No, no, I always go right. I always go, I always go in exactly the same direction, on the same terrain, on the same camber, for the same distance, and that's what I do. And that's all about repetitive load. So, you know, they're absolutely astounded when you say, right, yeah, well, you run five times a week, twice a week, I want you to go out the front door and turn left and see what happens. <laughs> and it's like, it's just about load redistribution, right? So, or go out and play basketball once a week instead of running or go out and run on a trail or go somewhere different because the shoe's not generally the issue, Brad. Sometimes it is, you know, sometimes there is an overt error 
made that can cause a problem. But I, I would say that nine times out of ten, um, it's it's more about the way people train. I read a really interesting thing from Tom Goom today where he was sort of redefining the 10% rule of increase and he was sort of uh, he was saying that he thought it was that that was really underdone but it was mileage dependent which I found quite interesting so I think there's there's a lot of things that we we attribute both good and bad things to footwear that that perhaps you know perhaps they're just not not there um, and, and that's not to say that footwear is not not important obviously I think it is very important I think it can play very important roles but I think it's an evolving process and Historically, we've looked at footwear um, in terms of cushioning and motion control. I completely discount those things. I, I don't think they're important at all. I think it's far more important to look at the geometry of the shoe and how quickly you can get through the rollover process. In other words, how quickly and efficiently and economically can you get from touchdown propulsion? That's really the key question, the key issue, rather than are you pronating or supinating um, what's your loading rate like? What's your peak impact um, uh, forces like? Those things, really, there's 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 very poor correlation with those and injury. So I think I think maybe we've been looking in the wrong spot all this time. It's interesting you say that, Simon. I have some uh, conversations with my father-in-law, who's hardcore uh, runner from bygone eras he's he's in his 70s now uh originally from poland he's run his clock he's ticked off a i think a 114 half half marathon so he can run and uh he he's never been a footwear guy and it's uh you know obviously he's studying podiatry in the early uh, late 90s going through the 2000s when this motion control stuff was so big we're sitting there and i remember that the, the christmas lunches george you know you need to look at this shoe it's rah 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 and i was just talking to him uh, which has obviously changed drastically since then but uh i was just talking to him recently and and uh i was uh, the discussion of load management and how to deal with injuries and so on and so forth and he's he's never stopped running this guy's a distance runner and he just goes yeah i start to get a niggle have two weeks off and then just ease my way back into it. And I think, like, he's never been educated on this. It's never been something which has been driven. It's just, you know, his knowledge of running in his body and load management himself. It's just uh, so that that's when footwear has really nothing to do with it, uh, everything about load management. Yeah, I'd, I'd be really interested on, on, in Brad's um, perspective on that because the – you know, the, the recovery side of things is something that runners generally don't talk about. Um, they, they don't tend to factor in um, structured recovery periods, and I think that's pretty important. Yeah, as a uh, practitioner and prior to that, a, a junior triathlete and a, a lover of running, I, uh, I used to be baffled by the fact that you'd see these old black and white photos of, you know, Ron Clark, John Landy, Herb Elliott, and these, the like, and you know, the legends of their training, you know, they were doing solid workloads, lots of uh, lots of running, lots of mileage with intensity. We know that the injury rates aren't too dissimilar now to, now to what they were decades ago. And, you know, so I used to sort of maintain as a therapist from early on that a runner should be able to run injury-free irrespective of what they have on their foot or feet. Yet if they have specific requirements or, you know, they are rehabilitating something, then you know, plumbing down to a, a prescription, if you like, or as you stated, Simon, a advice with some advanced information can be of use. But I, I maintain that at the start of my career, and I'd say I, I still maintain that now that it, it shouldn't matter what you've got on your feet. Uh, and it seems to be that the current literature supports that. So I do believe that one of the biggest factors is, you know, the workload of the runner and the conditioning of the runner. And certainly strength and conditioning in the running space has been given a real uh, a real nudge along in the last five five years or so. I think people don't think it through properly. So there's been all this um, uh, publicity about minimalism and maximalism versus traditional, and you know these terms are all quite new to our vernacular. But and and the, and the, the, these terms have become very polarising. So you're either kind of with us or you're against us. You know, so you're either into minimalism or you're not, or you're into maximalism or you're not. But this is a this is a complete nonsense because it, it, you can actually exploit either of those shoes or a traditional shoe for the benefit of the athlete if you understand 
how it all works. So, you know, our understanding now is quite clear. So if you if you have a minimalist shoe, then it's quite likely you will reduce the external um, the external knee joint loads um, and you'll increase the external ankle joint loads and, and the reverse will be true as you increase the stack or, or the drop of the shoe. So if you go to a traditional shoe that might have a 10 millimeter drop, then you are going to, you're going to increase the load at the knee and you're going to decrease the load at the Achilles tendon. So this is quite interesting because it means that if you've got patellofemoral pain, then it's perfectly sensible for you to put somebody into a minimalist shoe or do some um, structured um, monitored barefoot running, providing you, you are not developing symptoms elsewhere. But it gets quite interesting because when you look at things like uh, Achilles tendinopathy, one of the things we we understand now is that, that that load is quite good for that condition. So we we want to try to titrate load in that tendon. So I would make the argument and say, well, one of the ways you might be able to load that tendon is actually to be doing a little bit of barefoot training or actually go on a minimalist shoe, providing you can you can actually be on top of what that athlete is doing. So it, it's about actually understanding um, understanding how you can exploit the shoe. I think that's, that's the key issue, and that's probably what people are not thinking about because it's almost become a battle line that's drawn. You know, it's either good or it's bad. But the truth is it's neither good nor bad. It, it can be good or bad but it's entirely dependent on the individual needs of the athlete. Yeah, so it comes back to, I guess, lining up with what you said, Paul, around if you're going to buy a pair of shoes, which we all need to do, consider what sort of sporting gear you need. Look at it, look at it like a, a piece of sporting equipment and try and develop, I guess, some understanding as to the different shoe types that exist, the, the minimalist, the zero drops, the maximalist, the traditional motion control, how they might uh, affect you know, what it is that you're trying to achieve. And I guess that's a bit that the pub, the public finds difficult to comp, to uh, understand and is in, well, what do these different looking shoes do? So can we quickly summarise some of the key perspectives around these different four categories I like? I guess starting with the tra- traditional shoe, what is it? What does it look like and where did it come from? So a traditional shoe is, is um, I guess, this has been reasonably well defined as a highly cushioned, highly elevated shoe. Um, so it's going to have a um, it's going to have a drop, if if we like, and if people don't understand what a drop is, that's simply the differential between the the midsole thickness underneath the forefoot and the heel. Um, and it, and for most traditional shoes, it's going to be between eight and twelve millimeters. So let's draw the middle line and say it's going to be ten mil. That's pretty standard, and it's going to be fairly highly cushioned. So that's what it's going to look like. Now, the interesting thing here is that we have known, the research tells us that as you um, increase the cushioning in a shoe, you do not decrease the peak impact uh, loads. So in other words, the assumption is that as you increase cushioning, you're going to reduce impact. Uh, That's simply not true, and we've got good evidence for that. Uh, a very important biomechanist, Ben O'Neill, did the first experiment on this, Brad, in 1977, so 41 years ago, um, and he repeated it in 1987, was able to show that if you used a harder midsole material, you actually reduced the impact loading. So that's completely counterintuitive. If you increased the uh, – if you made it a harder material, you reduced the impact loading. If you think about that, that's actually quite sensible because it means that your body will recognise that that in, that uh, change in hardness. You will change the spring stiffness of the legs. In other words, you get more subtalar joint. So cushioning, pronation control. We also know that there is no evidence to tell us that directly that controlling or reducing subtalar joint pronation reduces injury. So to be looking at, at footwear that is focusing on Cushioning and reducing pronation, I think, and Paul, you can you can chime in here anytime you like. I think that's I think they're two failed paradigms. The the evidence for those is just not there. Does it mean that I'm an advocate of going to minimalist footwear or running barefoot? No, it does not. Um, does it mean I'm an advocate of maximalist footwear? 
uh, depends. It will work for some people. Does it mean I think there's there are different things we should be looking at, like vibration and the geometry of footwear? Absolutely, I think that's where it should be going. I just think we've been we've been looking in the wrong direction basically for all this time, and the reason we've been doing that is that uh, the industry has basically perpetuated this, and actually professions like podiatry do need to shoulder some responsibility and say, yeah, well, you know, th this is this is what we're, the story we've been telling. And it really has not been in step with a lot of the uh, of the evidence in the literature, and I think we've got to take that on the chin and say, well, it's actually time to start listening to the science and understanding that that maybe we need to be moving on from all that. Hundred percent. I think, like uh, uh, going back to what you were suggesting with regards to to the to the difference in in load, there's there's, there's probably two things. Firstly. It, I think what you're trying to say is that there's there's always going to be a hundred percent of load. It's it, you know it's not about dodging the fact that you're going to get that. It's about shifting the load to other anatomy. And so you know you're at a point now where we're looking at particular footwear that if uh, they're developed and we understand they have a reduced peak loading on some some parts of anatomy and that that person has a history of injury in that anatomy, then we can suggest maybe going for a shoe that doesn't. Uh, load in that particular way uh, and that would uh, you know create a better running experience and I think that's sort of starting to go it, well this is a good segue in itself I think that um, you know uh, running running is an un uncomfortable sport at best well I find it uncomfortable anyway um, and if you uh, you know the whole idea of, of athletic footwear is essentially also to make the the experience comfortable and this is the new thing, okay? Well, what's what's a good shoe? Well, it's a shoe that's comfortable, and I think that might sometimes confuse the consumer because they'll go and try on five or ten shoes, and they've been made to be comfortable. So, uh, you know, we need to kind of we need to I, I feel also have a better understanding of this uh, this suggestion that oh, comfort's the leading the leading factor in in what is a good shoe. Yeah, I think I think there are a couple. Of, if we were going to do a bit of futurism here, I think there are a couple of things that that are, are rapidly looming for us. I mean, the first is to look at vibration, which is you know it's been kind of the great black hole. So we know of all the input signals, um, and there there are probably nine or ten of them when you look at things things like like uh, force, pressure. Um, joint moments, vibration is is one of those input loads, and we 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 now understand that it, it's probably the most important in terms of a direct link to injury, because one of the one of the ways you you attenuate vibration is via muscle contraction. So essentially, if you contract the muscle, you don't allow the vibration to go up through the system. But the problem is when you when you contract the muscle. Then it fatigues. So, so you have you have the influence of fatigue, which changes your your running gait or your running biomechanics. And when you change running biomechanics over a distance, then there's a window of opportunity for injury. So that's that's a very important input signal that has been very under researched, and I think it's going to be quite important in the future. So there, I think there's a, a fundamental change in direction. I, I think that the comfort filter, as described by Ben O'Nig. Um, is is interesting. I think there's been a lot of uh, a lot of chips placed on that number, and I'm not sure that I would necessarily back that in. I think it's I think it's moderately important, but I don't think it's the be all and end all. I think there are some other quite important things we need to be looking at as as we we move forward uh, uh, in the next couple of years. So Simon, sorry, Brad, to interrupt just quickly. I was just going to while while we're talking about that, and we talked about comfort. If we talk about segmentation of the footwear industry, where it went through, let's just talk about last because I'm a fan of the perfect last, whatever that means. If you're talking about a, a straight lasted shoe versus a semi curved versus a curve, the footwear industry segmented straight last being for people who have uh, pez planus foot type. Uh, semi-curved for, say, let's inverted commas normal, and then uh, a curved last for a high arch or, you know, and they then started to use shock attenuation for the curved last and then dual density for the um, uh, for the straight-lasted shoes. So 
you know, a question for you, Simon, is there still um, is there still that segmentation of different last types that exist? Because if I have someone come into the clinic and I see a relatively Pez planus foot, they just don't get along with curved last footwear. It's just, you know, you just – and there is the risk that they're sold that, but you have to say, oh, look, this shoe might suit you a, a bit better than other, you know. That's – Mm. Well, you, you've just you've actually just raised one of the great furfies of the athletic footwear industry, mate. There's no such thing as a straight curved or semi curved last that doesn't exist. So I can give you an example with Asics. So Asics have one last. It's called EOR16. That's the name of the last, and it's used for all of their shoes, from the DS Trainer to the uh, to the the Fortis to their motion control shoe. Exactly the same last. The only the only difference is that they either dam, in other words, they 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 shore up the medial aspect of the shoe, or they sculpt it. So it's a visual um, impression. The the concept that there is actually a, a difference between curved, semi curved, and straight last shoe is a complete fallacy. It doesn't exist, and that's the same for every running shoe company. Um, they they use one last for all their running product. And the only variation on that would be for racing shoes, where they would have a different last, but for all of their mainstream running product, all their product, all their models, it will be one last. So that that's a really important thing for people to take home, that if you're making a, a value judgment based on the the shape of the shoe, then you've been conned, basically. It's one, it's one of the great cons of the athletic footwear industry. And to uh, advocate for the listener, the last meaning looking at the shoe from underneath and the, the geometry or the shape of it, is that correct? No, so the last is the actual model the shoe is made from, and the last is incredibly important. So the last is the, is the plastic model that looks somewhat like a foot that the shoe is built around. So every every running shoe in the Asics range is built around one single last identical shape. Every single model. So the last is uh, sorry to interrupt. The la- just so the listeners understand as well, the last is is the well, there's a saying in the footwear industry that last comes first. So you have to design the shape of the foot. Uh, that the shoe is actually moulded around, and that's quite a difficult uh, capture because well, it is a capture of a, a, a passive shape, so it's a uh, you know a still foot that we're trying to create. So this is a really it's a this is a really important uh, quite an important point in this discussion because when we talk about what the future is going to hold. Well, well, the future is here right now. So we're in a position now where we can three D where we can three D print last, right? So we can act, so somebody can come into your clinic right now, tomorrow, Wednesday. They can come in. They can do a laser scan. It can be uploaded to a factory, and we can build a last of their foot that looks just like their foot, and we can build the shoe around that last. Now, six months ago, that couldn't be done. It wasn't possible. The last actually had to have a flat bottom because that's the the shoe had to be constructed in that way. There are new techniques available that Paul and I have seen uh, in Belgium that allow us now to build a shoe that is based on a uh, a, a three dimensional model of your foot. We are we are right now in a position where we can build mass produced bespoke footwear, which 12 months ago was an oxymoron. You can't, you can't have mass-produced bespoke footwear, but you can now. So, so these are very exciting times for the industry because it means that you know you could have somebody who could have an exostosis or a bunion or uh, Alex Valgus or, or all sorts of different things, and you can actually, you can actually order those shoes. Um, you, you can send that information upline, and uh, you can have them back in your practice in a week. So, so just to add, just, just to add on to that, Brad, this is essentially a a situation where, as Simon said, someone can walk in, uh, and we they have um, extremely accurate force plate analysis of centre of pressure. So you'll have someone uh, uh, walk over a force plate uh, a dozen times. It averages out, or run over the force plate a dozen times. Sorry, it'll average out the uh, the centre of pressure. And then, so that's the dynamic capture. And then you get uh, a still capture, 
a passive capture of someone standing up. So you have this matchup of uh, the still foot and then the dynamic foot. And so you make the shoe off the still foot, but the characteristics of that shoe may relate to the dynamic part of the 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 the, uh, the capture. So uh, up until now, we've got just one last one size. It might be a nine and a half size in a Asics whatever, and all of the shoes are made off that. Doesn't matter what what um, mechanical characteristics you have. However, now we're moving into a phase where it's essentially you have that one capture of uh, a um, of a still foot, and you might you know redo that every five to 10 years or something, but at least it's updated. And then you have your footwear manufactured specific to that. And parts of those shoes are actually 3D printed on site. So it's a, yeah. it's a, it's very disruptive and very, uh, you know, very uh, customized, mass customized, I think you could say. Yeah. So, so on the back of that, what, what will, what will, what will happen is that like right now, as I said, there's one last for, for all the range there, there quite likely will be in the very near future um, an offering of 100 or 200 lasts. And, and it will be a very simple process to match the biometric data to the, the last that will best match. Or even more interesting, there will be a robotic last. And a robotic last, if you can imagine, you know, that toy that has all the pins where you can put your hand in and you get an imprint of, a, of, uh, of your hand, you know what I'm talking about? Yes. So the robotic glass, so basically the, the data will be fed into the robot and the pins will create the last in an infinite combination of ways. So it will be an exact, very exact reproduction of, uh, of, of your foot and then it will all just go dead. The next data will come through. It will be completely different depending on, on, on the data input. So, you know, the, the, the potential now is, is as absolutely astronomical to get very accurate volumetric fit, very accurate contouring of materials, full contact of midsoles, you know, uh, all sorts of different things that, that were not possible even a year ago. So, and, and marry that to what's going on with materials technology uh, yeah, it's pre it's pretty incredible, actually. What's what's on the way? So we're on a uh, the cusp of uh, I guess what seems or sounds to me to be a, a footwear revolution in uh, as you say the mass production but bespoke uh, options with potential shoe manufacturers having a multitude of lasts versus the the one sort of size fits all with with uh, you know being built out from there. But I guess the the cynic in me, having uh, seen the debate rage for as long as I've been a practitioner and as many years as I've been a runner, is that, well, the the early years, the pioneering of the motion control, traditional shoe, if you like, to counter the pronation effect, to, to be cushioned, to reduce impact loading, didn't change anything. The minimalism, the you know, the low drop shoes, the, the maximalism that sort of rebounded off the back of that, um, hasn't really been shown to reduce running injuries either. They can change loading and parameters and things like that. But it's, what, what would be the basis of getting excited about this bespoke nature of these uh, different, different offerings? Footwear companies, are, well, they're not obligated, but they're driven by, well, like everyone else, they have to make a buck. But And the way in which you do that is you you cater for the consumer sentiment. So, so uh, I mean, look, let's be honest, the barefoot, the whole barefoot paradigm, which I don't even know if the right term is barefoot because you wore shoes uh, that were, were sort of modelled off barefoot. So uh, like, it was all sort of modelled off the conspiracy that the footwear industry was having a lend of us and not uh, bad for your feet or whatever else. It just went down this pathway and, look, they're profiting off you. And But, but the irony of that and the hypocrisy was the fact that uh, Vibram, the Vibram Five Fingers, they were really cheap to make and they were like 160 bucks a pair. Uh, they were making profit as well. Don't worry about that. Uh, you know, so everything had had a, um, uh, a, a business model, but it also catered for the consumer. Like I know there's people out there right now that really like some motion control shoes. And it might not be because of the motion control, but they just like the shoes. And so this is where you, you have the, the Brooks consideration where they had their, there we go, Simon, straight-lasted shoe, which was the, uh, you know, what was it, that uh, the addiction? 
uh, yeah, little beasts or whatever, they've started to move away from motion control and they've got these guide guidance rails in now. And the reason for that is because there's still that consumer out there that really likes this type of shoe. They really feel they need that, that extra support or whatever they call it. And so Brooks would have been mad to go and turn around and say, well, we're just getting rid of anything which influences movement whatsoever, which is probably where the research is heading toward. They're more along the lines of catering for the consumer. So irrelevant of what we know, footwear companies are still obligated to provide this marketplace for the consumer that wants to go there and, and buy that product. And as, as soon as you take that product away, well, they have to go somewhere else and the market determines that. That's uh, essentially my view on it. Uh, I think... Yeah, uh, I, I think, I mean, I, I applaud you for being a cynic, Brad. I think that's I think that's a good thing, especially, especially as a runner. Um, you know, you're a bit more informed in all of this and I think that it's a, it's a healthy thing to be cynical. So I think what minimalism brought us was quite valuable because the because the the industry was building ridiculously complicated footwear that offered no benefit. So there's all this stuff being put into shoes, and all it did was add weight, and weight's the enemy of the runner. So you know everybody agrees that you don't you, you don't want to have weight in a shoe. So I think what it did was it, it kind of dropped the dropped the the atomic bomb on the industry, and and it forced a huge shake up. And so what we have seen is uh, a great deal of looking in into in the industry of, of what's real, where do we want to go? And and what it has done is it's basically dismantled this concept that you could not build a shoe that was lightweight and flexible and responsive, but still offered very good structure and support because that is the case. You can build a very lightweight shoe that is very flexible and very responsive and very comfortable that is still very supportive. And that's really moving towards where we want to be. You want to, you want to have footwear that is interactive. I mean, at the end of the day, I think one of the problems here, and your point's very well made, okay, so nothing's changed. You know, the injury rates haven't changed. Why haven't the injury rates changed? This is the, the fundamental question. In 40 years, they haven't changed. Well, they haven't changed because probably in 1973, you know, the average runners runner looked like Bill Rogers, and now the average runner looks like Oprah Winfrey. You know, that's that's part of the issue. So that and that's that's an important point to make. But the the other the other the other key issue here, I think, is that we really want to be looking at at systems that are providing more feedback and more response in a lighter weight package that are focusing on different issues than than the things we've been bogged down with 40 years. So motion control and cushioning, we, we need to be looking at, at what else is available for us that is going to help. And that may well start and finish with what the athlete walks out of the shop with. So I think retail has an incredibly important role and responsibility to play here so they have to actually understand that the shoe is not about trying to realign the foot to vertical it's the shoe is is the interface between the ground and the foot and and the shoe is really responsible for things like collapse so does it collapse in the middle if it does that then it's you know it's obviously not doing its job properly um, it's it's very important in terms of comfort. It's very important in terms of the noise filter. So is it slappy? What's the ride like? Um, is it uh, you know is it is it not functioning in terms of the rollover process? Th- these are the discussions that we need to be having, and the new discussions really. You're listening to Simon Bartold and Paul Griffin on this expert edition of the Physical Performance Show with a deep dive into all things modern day running shoes. Support for today's show comes from the Gold Coast Marathon. Like the Physical Performance Show, the Gold Coast Marathon encourages runners of all ages and abilities to push their boundaries and to strive to complete a personal challenge. The Gold Coast Marathon is held annually on the first weekend in July and is a must-do event for any budding athlete, weekend warrior, or family looking for a challenge to complete together. Run for the good times at the Gold Coast Marathon. Visit goldcoastmarathon.com.au. Support for today's show also comes from Pogo Physio. We exist to help you get back to your physical best following injury. We want 
everyone who walks through the doors of Pogo Physio to complete their rehabilitation, get back to their physical best, and in doing so, cross their physio finish line. We do not want to see you for a session more than what you need or a session less. We just want to ensure that you get back to your physical best and enjoying the things that you love to do. To find out more about Pogo Physio's unique services, including our fixed fee and very popular monthly wellness booster rehabilitation packs or our one-hour initial comprehensive physiotherapy appointments, jump over to pogophysio.com.au. For now, let's jump back with Paul Griffin and Simon Bartold on this expert edition focusing on all things the modern-day running shoe. Tomorrow, if, if a listener is going in to get very practical here, gentlemen, uh, to distill your wisdom into some takeaways for the listener, they're going to the local retail footwear running shoe store tomorrow. What are Simon Bartold's and Paul Griffin's three top tips on how they should make their shoe purchase very practically? Okay, I'll, I'll have a crack at this. I would, I would say the number one tip is do not make wholesale changes. So in other words, don't do not be seduced into going from the shoe that you are used to to a much lower drop shoe, because that is a, a recipe for disaster unless you are prepared to radically change, radically reduce your training and build up again. So that's a, that's a, that's a big issue, um, and that is not a commentary on minimalism. It's just a fact that you can't make the body doesn't doesn't respond well to to, to radical changes. Um, I would say um, choose the lightest weight footwear you can find that will work for you within the confines of that that lightweight. Um, and finally, uh, if it's not comfortable, then it's not the right shoe for you. Brilliant. So just to recap, don't make massive changes. Uh, light ideally is better if you can find that and look for comfort. Thank you, Simon. Paul, what would be your top three practical tips for the runner going to buy a pair of shoes tomorrow? I uh, definitely feel, um, <clears throat> firstly, the the the, the retailer. <clears throat> so make sure it's a a, um, a reputable uh, running shoe uh, retailer that offer uh, a range of range of options that would be suitable. Um, and and I think uh, that also fits in with the the fit for intended use. So um, you know, uh, don't go to a specialty trail running store to buy road running shoes i'm just making an example here but don't you know uh don't go to a store that won't be able to provide that 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 service to you um i think sort of along the same lines as simon be realistic with what type of shoe you like you know i i always say this i i really when i was back living in perth i really enjoyed surfing and i was surfing a lot and for many years i just bought similar board dimensions to kelly slater although i was like something like 35 kilos heavy so I, I wanted to surf like Slater, but I just, you know, uh, I wasn't fit for that uh, for that mould. And I think that uh, similar sort of thing with footwear is just, uh, you know, it, we all like the, the the lightweight racy types, but sometimes it's just just too minimalist c- can can sometimes not be a, a, a good thing. Uh, so so I would sort of uh, find something to. Uh, that would be suitable, and then I'll probably it's not it's not probably fitting in with the pre-purchase thing, but after the purchase thing, I wouldn't go bashing out in new footwear, doing too much too soon. So uh, ease your way into them, and uh, you know get a bit of uh, a feeling for what's what's happening there, and and, and progress slowly. And turn left instead of right, for goodness' turn sake. Turn left. Yeah, turn left, I can only turn left. <laughs> and, you know, that turning left versus right, I mean, it really speaks to prior guest running researcher, American physical therapist, Rich Willie's sharings that, you know, particularly for masters runners, mix up the pace. Uh, don't get stuck in that messy middle, you know, the uh, intensity blindness of every run, the same intensity as well. So, so great stuff. Gentlemen, a couple of frequently asked questions that I know you'd field and certainly I field in my professional work, but the first being, when should a runner change their shoes? Ah, the eternal question. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> well, it it depends. <laughs> it well, depends. If I'm in a shoe shop, I'd say weekly. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I think that <laughs> the the data the data is reasonably. Uh, it depends on the shoe. So you know, it's it's not it's it's horses for courses. So some shoes are more robust than other shoes. But I think um, for the listeners. 
much to their dismay, the the truth is probably somewhere between six and eight hundred kilometres, they're going to be pretty gone. So, it, so what happens after about two hundred kilometres is that the um, the midsole essentially starts to uh, degenerate, um, and it continues to do so until about two hundred k's, and then it kind of stabilises and, it, and it, it, it's okay for a period of about another four hundred k's, and then and then it starts to quite rapidly degenerate. So I think. I think there's there's pretty reasonable consensus that six to eight hundred kilometres is about the reasonable limit for uh, for a shoe for a runner who who wants to maintain whatever protection that shoe can offer. It might have lasted a decade. Yeah. If it's six hundred k's, whew. no. So uh, I, I was going to yeah, say you're, that you're, um, you're, 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 you're 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 running in the in the speed cross or something, aren't you? They're built to they're, they're built like a Sherman tank. Yeah, I've got a I've got a few different types. I wouldn't call it running. I call it shuffling. But yeah. we've got um we've got. I, I would suggest I'm going to throw it back the other way and say, running is uh, in my view there's a fair amount of trial and error just because of the different factors and no one's the same uh, and neither is neither of the shoes. And I think that the runner generally knows when when enough's enough, but it's usually, there's usually like an, an error that leads to that, that point where they appreciate the limits of the shoe. So it's, uh, it's, they find, they quite often find out the hard way. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I often say you generally get a sense that it's, it's starting to, uh, not be as responsive. And, uh, at that, that point, the, the next logical question is why, how can a runner determine if they should change shoe types? So they've realized that they need to purchase another pair of shoes, but you know, their neighbor might suggest that you should try the new Brooks. Uh, and yet there are an Asics runner that's always running Asics and they're seduced by the, uh, the romanticism of these new well packaged <laughs> colored shoes. So, uh, <laughs> once again, I know the answer from you, Simon and yourself, Paul, probably it depends. Cause of course it always does. There's a lot of, there's a lot of money. There's a lot of money goes into that seduction, Brad. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, is it better to, if it's working, just the good old adage, if it's working, don't change it. Just go and buy the same pair of shoes again. Uh, obviously, if everything's working well, is the argument there that, well, maybe you could try something lighter because, as you've noted, Simon, speed is uh, sorry, weight is the enemy of, of speed and a runner's ambition. So uh, what's, yeah. what's the best way to proceed? Any advice? I'm a, I'm a fan. I, I think this gets back to the assessment process, and this is the, this is the great conundrum because – this, this often – I'm not retail bashing because I, I, there are some very good retail stores out there. But at the end of the day, um, you know, if, if – and, and this is an interesting question because it folds into, into, into one of the great mal- malaises of the industry that, you know, we saw 2,000 doors close in the USA last year, 2,000 retail doors closed. So there's a huge pressure on um, running shoe retail from e-commerce because if you – are a runner and you go into a store and they say, what are you wearing? I'm wearing the Kano 24. No worries. Here's the Kano 25. Proceed to the cash register. Why would you go back to that store? Why would you not just buy those shoes online? So this gets back to what, what sort of, what sort of service is being offered at retail. And if they are, they are actually engaging with the runner and they're interested enough to ask you about your history, about what your aspirations are, what you want to do? Do you just want to be able to uh, drink beer and eat pizza uh, and, and not get too fat, or do you want to race? Um, what What do you want to do as a runner? Um, where do you want to go? What's your injury history? Um, you know, if they're engaged enough to ask you those questions and try to actually understand how you might have progressed, um, then I think that's an important thing. It always fascinates me that. Um, running is one of the very few sports where it seems like there people don't recognise the aspiration. So if you're a golfer and you start off as a golfer, it's very unlikely you're going to end up with the same set of clubs when you start to compete. And it's also very unlikely that you won't have engaged a, a coach you, to get better. Um, and runners don't seem to do this. They They seem to 
be stuck in this rut where they will just assume that they will go from model to model and just upgrade the model. But the fact is that they probably started off running because they were overweight because that's the main reason people start running for, mo for, for most runners. So you're going to assume, Brad, that as they run, if they stick with the sport, they're going to get stronger, they're going to get fitter, they're going to get faster, and they're going to lose weight. So surely their equipment should change, shouldn't it? Yeah, brilliant. And that comes back to your starting point, Paul. The pair of uh, shoes are really just to be viewed as a pair of as a bit of sporting equipment. Um, and so, uh, like Simon's talking about uh, proficiency, and I think that's that's essentially a big part of or something that we probably haven't touched on yet. But but uh, running proficiency and 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 what sort of equipment they use it does it does have a bearing as well, but. Um, I've, I've often been really interested in the psyche of the runner and, and I think even another layer of more complexity is that is the triathlete and they are influenced by their group of mates that they run with. It only, it only takes sort of one to sort of tease another sort of piece of equipment. Let's just say, you know, the, the latest thing is the, 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 the hocker, uh, the maximalist rocker bottom, lightweight, ticks a few boxes and it's just different, right? So... So it's just nice to try something different, and then for some reason we call this range of shoes, whether it be the uh, you know, the uh, adrenaline, uh, Kayano, in, inspire sort of range of what we call conventional footwear. So that's the the the, the standard looking shoe, and I think for someone to sort of they'll always have that as the centerpiece and they'll go either side and, and it's it's you know we used to have one pair of shoes and we used to go and run and wear them out but now i think your runners average the closet would have average you know three or four different pairs of shoes for different sessions you know the intervals i wear oh, i wear those for intervals i'll wear these for my long run uh, no i'm not racing in those i'm going to race in my racing flats it's just it's, uh, you know, as soon as you start to take running seriously and you become more proficient, you also become a shoe connoisseur. Yes, so interesting. Uh, I'm certainly a, a runner with more than one pair of shoes in the closet and, and I've always viewed that as a physiotherapist as a positive thing for the runner that's built up conditioning over years, maybe started with their faithful model and then they've started to, you know, become more adventurous in the quest for a lighter shoe or the next best thing. Um, and I've viewed that as that variability, as I think you mentioned, Simon, going out and turning right rather than left all the time could only be a good thing. So would you both view that professionally as a, as a plus if a runner does have a shoe closet with more than one type of shoe in it? Oh, d definitely for me. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, I kind of view this is one of the problems with segmentation, Brad, that, you know, it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a, a Pac-Man box, you know, and you've got, you got the, you got a little scared consumer in the middle, and you got all these Pac-Man racing to each of the corners, and the corners are you know motion control, um, cushioning, structured cushioning, neutral, and and basically it's it's just all confusion. Whereas it should be a bit simpler. It should be like a, a T junction in a road where the runner arrives at the T junction, and you either you either have an entry point where you've got a, a shoe that is pretty much a go-to product. Or you turn you turn right for a bit more support, or you turn left for something that's lighter and faster, and it actually should be that simple. Um, and and that's the aspirational model. So, and, and this involves the runner, which I really like. I really like the fact that they're involved in the decision making process. So, yeah, I want to race. I, I need something that that is lighter and faster on a lower drop because it makes sense. If you want to go faster, you should be down around six mil. Um, but you might have for your longer runs, you might actually have something that's um, that, that's got a bit more grunt to it, um, and you'll use that for your longer runs. When you're doing your tempo runs, you'll use something that's much much lighter, um, and that, that's the way you get faster, right? We we all understand that. Um, you might even, heaven forbid, you might even have a pair of trail shoes in your kit bag, and you might once or twice a week you might get up into the hills and do a bit of trail running because, as Rich Willie says, I mean. This is how you vary the load. I mean, the human body hates repetitive load. It doesn't respond well to it at all. So I think if, you're, if, you, if you understand this and you understand mixing the input signals up, then you, you're more than a fair chance that you're, gonna, you, you're not only going to be a better runner, but you're probably going to be less injured. How many times, Simon and Brad, have you uh, seen the, the patient present to the clinic and they've, they're, they're – um, recreational runners and they and they uh 
they've had this one pair of shoes that they've run in and they bring them in and you could just see when the patient walks or runs in the shoe, you could just see the pattern which would create that tissue stress to relate to to whatever they're presenting with. And you just you just think, well, that's a, a classic case of where there's not been any variation or differentiation in, in the loading of the uh, uh, in the loading patterns. And it goes back to that, you know, different people load different tissues differently. And, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, you can work with that different and say, okay, mix up the footwear, mix up the training patterns, mix up the loading, so on and so forth. But if you work against that different and keep everything the same, that's when we're in trouble. You're listening to Paul Griffin and Simon Bartold on this expert edition, sharing around all things modern day running shoes. If you missed last week's episode featuring Australian dual 10,000 metre champion and up and comer Stewie Mack, then here's a little snippet of what you missed from that featured performer episode. So pretty much on a Monday, I'll do two runs. So I do a 50 or 60 minute run in the morning and then a short run at night. Tuesday, I'll do a track workout or just a simple eight eight by one K longer reps, um, gym during the day and then another run at night. Wednesday I'll do two easy runs. Thursday I'll do a threshold run. So that's we have we probably do about nine K at heart rate or it can vary depending on the time of season. Um, another run in the Arvo and then Friday I'll just do a really light light jog. Um, that's kind of my recovery day. Um, and then Saturday we'll do hill reps or threshold work in the morning and then I'll do another run and then Sunday is just a single training session I'll do um, a long run so that can vary from 90 minutes to two hours if I'm trying to get ready for a 10k to tune into the full episode and explore the archives of the physical performance show jump over to your favorite podcast player or peruse the show notes over at pogophysio.com.au for now let's jump back with Paul Griffin and Simon Bartold on this expert edition focusing on all things the modern day running shoe. Selection, trends and misconceptions. Gentlemen, uh, finally, last two uh, two lines of questioning here. Uh, the Nike 4% uh, carbon fibre plate, uh, certainly the world record falling by, to Elliot Kipchoge there recently in the Berlin Marathon has uh, absolutely given a, a boom to the, the interest in, in the, the Nike shoes with carbon in the middle of the shoe in the sole. So uh, what are your views on the, the carbon plate and the, the future of that? I just hate the fact that the focus has been taking off Kipchoge and what he did. I completely don't buy into this being the, uh, being the, the, the performance um, the performance advantage. I, I mean, I, I just think that that what he what he did was uh, what he what he must have put into that in terms of all the planning and all the the training and the nutrition and the hydration and every other part of the of the jigsaw puzzle for him to, to do that time was completely undermined by the fact he wore the the Vaporfly four percent and and whilst I I love what Nike have done and I think it's uh, you know I think it's really interesting. I'm quite I'm quite offended at, at how much the athlete's been taken out of the picture here. The, the sorry, the the actual athletic performance has been taken out of the picture here, and and it's been portrayed that it was the shoe, not the athlete, and, and I think that's a real shame. I um I uh, love footwear innovation. You know that's that's just something that. Uh, you know, whenever from a practitioner perspective, you see the, the someone come in with a new pair of shoes, and you sort of you, you, you work back and see you, you find out what these innovators are trying to achieve. And and I, I love everything about that shoe. I love I love the the aesthetics, the the silhouette. I love the the innovation. I love the fact that they put in the cheeky uh, carbon plate. Well, that might not do much, but look, let's uh, let's just put it in there because no one else has got it. It's really going to upset some people. They really push that, you know. They really they really push that side of things, and it's got people talking as to whether or not it should be allowed in races. And the other thing with that that shoe is that it's it really is for performers. Like it's it's quite hard to use that shoe if you're not not a proficient runner. And so, and and they've created this market where there's a real demand for it. You just can't get them. 
And so, so I, okay. I, 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 if we're talking about if we're talking about footwear, I love it. I love that aspect. But like, I do agree with Simon. It's really taken away from it. But you know, look, I, I get what Nike do, are doing, and they've done it really well. And so, so I guess the takeaway is uh, don't get too excited. Uh, you know, you can buy into the uh, you know the hype if you like, but it still can't replace the basics of going and running more miles. Because uh, if you want to run faster, run run more miles. Oh, absolutely. Hundred percent. I think. I think. The, I think. There's another secondary question here too, Brad, and that is, um, in amongst all the positives, and and I look, I, I really do applaud Nike and what they did. I think it's it's awesome. But in amongst all the positives, it's the same basic question: Is it for everybody? Because there's a bunch of people who probably shouldn't be wearing that shoe who right now are wearing that shoe, and the question will be: Is there going to be a downside to this? And I reckon there might be. So. Time will tell. Goes back to me wanting to surf like Kelly Slater, really, doesn't it? Exactly, exactly right. Yeah, time will tell. Gentlemen, uh, to finish on a, a very challenging question, if, if you could both boil everything you've learnt down through your substantial years in your profession uh, to one piece of advice to listeners listening to help them perform at their own physical best, what is your piece of advice going to be? My advice would be to go out and try to find the least amount of shoe possible to perform the task you want to achieve. Um, And for some people that will be a hoka and for some people it will be a vibram five fingers. But you want to be trying to find the least amount of shoe possible. And just to reiterate, the reason that matters, Simon, is because weight has been shown to... Uh, decrease running efficiency. You know, if the, the greater the weight, the less of the running efficiency. Correct? Yeah, yeah. Weight, weight, pretty much. Weight, pretty much influences everything. Thank you, Simon. Paul, my number one for the recreational runner is is establish a um, well. I'll, I'll mould it into two. Establish a, a good reputation with. Uh, sorry, a good relationship with a reputable uh, retailer, or where you can. Go and get some advice, or from a practitioner, or whoever it may be that can act as a, a bit of an advocate. I guess you can say to ensure that you know uh, they can identify what your needs are for the footwear, and then ensure you get the desired outcome. And, and on the flip side of that, um, I would suggest that don't fall into blanket calls. Oh, Hocker is better. Asics are better. Oh, you know, we shouldn't be looking at, we should be looking at this because I just don't think it's about one particular thing. There's so much variation out there. It just comes down to your specific needs and uh, and and using that piece of sporting equipment and getting the most out of your, uh, you know, most enjoyment and performance out of your, uh, out of the sport, out of the running. I think you're only allowed one word, you Griffo. Oh, okay. I'd, I'll probably go for... Blanket calls more than more than reputable. I'd say I'd say blanket calls is probably the the biggest risk to the runner. I reckon blanket calls. Simon, earlier you mentioned vibration plus geometry of the shoes has been important and new frontiers in the development of the running shoe. Uh, I believe you're working on some interesting things in the space of vibration. So it's uh, it's new for new new to me to hear. Uh, this terminology in the in the building of a running shoe. So, are you able to elaborate a little on what you're learning and and why it matters? Yeah, I can. I think it's I think it's pretty important, Brad. It's 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 fairly new. Um, it's a, it's kind of a black hole. It's a space that hasn't been investigated too much. But but to, to try to explain it simply, basically, um, all human tissue vibrates when it uh, when it gets hit. So obviously, when you strike the ground, tissues will vibrate from. Uh, from the fatty tissue of your heel right up to um, the top of your head. And uh, we need to attenuate or, or reduce that vibration, otherwise it has a, uh, a significant effect in terms of um, load uh, and it can even affect things like um, uh, your visual acuity. So in other words, if you get a big vibration going through your system, you can't see properly as an extreme example. but. But basically, what we what we understand, we've been doing a lot of research in this area. We've actually managed to um, map the frequency of vibrations of twenty four different tissues from the Achilles tendon up to the cervical spine. So we actually understand the frequency range. Now that's quite important because um, if you have an input signal, 
So in other words, if when you strike the ground, the, the, the vibration generated matches the frequency of the tissue vibration, you have something that's called resonance. And resonance is very bad for the human body. Um, we, it, it, it has a direct implication to injury of tendon, nerve, blood vessels, muscles, and bone. So very, very important in things like stress fractures and those sorts of things. So basically, if we understand how you can change the input frequency with a shoe to shift it away from the tissue vibration frequency, well, then you're on a winner. Now, that, I, hope that's, I hope that sounds reasonably simple, but it's, it's quite complex science, but um, it's very exciting area. So we now have a pretty good understanding of how to shift this, um, this frequency um, away from the tissue frequency with footwear. Um, we, we understand how to, how to dampen that with midsole technology, and it's pretty exciting stuff, actually. So the, what this means is that we, we, may, we may, for the first time, and I, 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 I'm underlining may, for the very first time, we may actually be able to design footwear that absolutely makes a difference to injury, which is pretty Pretty incredible. I feel I get the sense from your sharings, Paul and Simon, that uh, really we are on the cusp of some uh, really interesting times with running shoes. So uh, I guess watch this space. Yeah, there's some there's some very cool stuff coming, and it's not just in terms of materials, technology. It's just in terms of um, what what do you do with with shapes and geometries, which are which is so intriguing to me. I mean, I've never understood why why running footwear is angular. It doesn't make any sense at all. Um, the foot's not an angular, angular structure, so why is a shoe? So we, we, we have a great understanding of how you can change um, change loads by, by just altering geometry, and, and that's very much to watch this space as well. And the other interesting factor just to add on to there with regards to vibration is the flow-on effect of that research, should it be proven, is that if you are a consumer that walks into a, a shop and purchases a shoe that um, has a particular uh, resonation with your Achilles tendon, for example, and and that shoe is proven to have um, uh, the, the same frequency vibration, uh, then and that person purchases that shoe, then they're at greater risk of injury. And the flip side of that is that then the retailer is then responsible for that, and so the future of footwear could well be in the hands of uh, you know practitioners or people that are, are more uh, in in tune of uh, with regards to um, uh, in regards to the understanding of running injury. Yeah, that's that's another that's another whole discussion about where 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 the retail environment is going to be. But I suspect that the you know I I, I said that there are two thousand doors have closed in the USA uh, in in the last financial year. That stake's got to be picked up somewhere. It's not all going to be picked up by e-commerce, and um, I, I would bet that stake is going to be picked up in physiotherapy and podiatry practices across the world. Gentlemen, uh, thank you for sharing uh, an insight into your learnings and your careers to date, uh, helping to uh, you know bring l- listeners up to speed with some of the contemporary, uh, uh, I guess, debates and debunking some of the myths around the running shoe industry, and, and also for that. Uh, finishing point there on the future of uh, running shoes it's quite exciting and one thing's for certain no matter what people have on their feet people will continue to run and by the looks of it in increasing numbers so if listeners want to find out more about uh, you, you, you both of you gentlemen individually but also with the Bartold clinical uh, line of work where's the best place to go so they can go to instagram brad at um, Barthold underscore clinical um, or twitter at Barthold biomecca um, or they can go to Facebook, um, which is www.facebook.com backslash Bartold Clinical. And uh, there's mo- enough information there to keep them happy and going for a long time, I think. Um, so lots of, lots of stuff put up there every, every single day. 
And I certainly uh, have enjoyed uh, following the Barthold Clinical Instagram gallery of late. There's been some great posts going up there, so I certainly suggest jump over and uh, give the uh, the account a follow. So, gentlemen, thanks for sharing. Uh, Paul, you're in Europe, and uh, Simon, you're in Australia. So, uh, thanks for uh, thanks for your input. Thanks so much, Brad. Really thanks, enjoyed. Brad. So there you have it, another expert edition of the Physical Performance Show. And I trust you enjoyed today's episode. And I also trust that there's someone in your world that you know who would benefit from the sharings of Paul and Simon today. So if there is someone, then please feel free to share the episode with them and to also let Simon and Paul know what it was that you learned or took from today's episode or fire off questions to the gentleman And they're very easy to find over at Bartold underscore clinical on Instagram. Feel free to communicate any feedback to myself over at Brad underscore beer on Instagram, as well as the show handle at physical performance show, where you can also tag in your podsies. Podsies are simply a screenshot of the episode that you're enjoying and the learnings that you're taking at any given time. Huge thanks to those who have been leaving ratings and reviews for the Physical Performance Show over on iTunes. In particular, a shout out this week to Damien Stride, who rated the show five stars, commenting, Since finding this podcast, I constantly check my phone daily to see if there is another new episode to listen to. I take away key learnings from every interview to not only better myself as an athlete, but also as a person. The amazing stories inspire me and really put things into perspective and that was especially evident after listening to Clint Kimmons' story. Keep up the great work. Damien, thank you for taking the time to leave that review. Please be in touch and we'll be shooting out to you a copy of You Can Run Pain-Free, my running bestseller, in the post as a little way of saying thank you. If you have been enjoying the show, then please don't forget to hit subscribe. Subscribing is the best way to help this show reach more earbuds of people just like yourself who are looking to pursue and perform at their own physical best. A massive thanks to the three good folk who make the show possible each and every week, Daryl Misson, our audio engineer, Susan Wilkin, All Things Show Administration, and Matthew Walding on All Things Show Graphic Design. Another massive thank you to today's show sponsor, the Gold Coast Marathon. If you are looking for a great mid-year event, held on the beautiful Gold Coast, then do not miss the Gold Coast Marathon. It is one of my favorite events annually, and you can select an event ranging from the junior dashes right through to the feature-length marathon. Jump over to goldcoastmarathon.com.au. Now, if you're into your running and you're yet to read the revised and expanded second edition of You Can Run Pain-Free, then we have a little gift for you, and that is 50% off the recommended retail price of $29.95. For the book, simply by jumping over to pogophysio.com.au, visiting the shop, and entering the promo code POGO2019. That's capital P-O-G-O 2019, the numbers. Don't forget to jump over and follow Bartold underscore clinical on Instagram and see what the gentlemen are up to. They really are the leaders in this space of the modern day running shoe. Now coming up next week on the Physical Performance Show, we return to a featured performer episode, this time featuring Olympic, Commonwealth and World Championship swimming medalist, Taylor McEwen. Next week, Taylor shares around the highs, the lows and the learnings of her swimming career to date. There's some great takeaways, so be sure to be tuning in next week for Taylor McEwen. Until then, keep pursuing your physical best performance. I'm Brad Beer, and this has been the Physical Performance Show.